Thank you very much for, for coming this afternoon and thanks to Louise and Google Food Talks for, for inviting me to speak. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, orthorexia. Um, any of you have any idea what orthorexia is? Some of you are nodding, some are saying no, not so sure. What, what, would you, what would you say orthorexia was? What was your kind of, what's your kind of definition? Unhealthy obsession with healthy eating. Yeah, pretty much, you've pretty much hit the nail on the head there. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. So, um, so yeah, it is, it's, I think it's a really interesting topic. It's a fairly new term. Um, it was only um, sort of brought to a, our attention in 1996 when Steve Bratman, um, he's a, a physician in, in the States, kind of identified it as, a, as an issue with a lot of his clients who were kind of trying to be healthy but had almost got to the point where it was obsessive. So when you break down orthorexia, it, it is basically the obsession with being pure, of eating correctly is the exact term. Um, and I think it's come about because there are so many kind of ideas around what healthy is. So kind of my, one of my questions to you is, what does it actually mean to be healthy in 2017? I mean, what, what are your thoughts? You know, I, I ask this, whenever I do workshops, and I do workshops with schools, with athletes, with coaches, um, with uh, school nurses a lot as well, because I do a lot of work around disordered eating and, and sort of poor relationships with food. It's really interesting what comes back. So I'd love to know what you think healthy eating is or what, health, what it means to be healthy in, in 2017. Yep. Personally, yep. I don't think you should not eat kind of Yeah. Yeah, I love the fact that you've picked up on the term balance. We'll go back to that at some point. Anybody else want to add anything else? Getting your fruits and veg yep. always seems like a healthy thing yep. to do. Yeah. And I think one of the things I want to make really clear here is um, sometimes people get the wrong idea about what I'm trying to promote. I am a dietitian, so I do promote a very healthy way of eating, which does mean majority eating lots of fruit, vegetables, whole grains, um, actually in line with some of the, the things that you do here at Google. So it is, it is what I promote. What I want to bring to the attention here is that actually sometimes in some people, we can get a little bit extreme. And when it becomes extreme, it starts to affect your health and your mental health that's when it becomes a problem and that's what I'm seeing more and more of and so that's kind of what I want to talk about today. So yeah, so one of the challenges I have as a practitioner is that there are so many messages about food. I'm sure every single day you pick up your phone, you look at magazines and there's always something new. What should we eat? Who should we follow? What should we do? And obviously while I'm a big fan of social media, I think it can do lots of really positive things and get some really positive messages out there. I'm also slightly nervous of it because I think it creates influences that don't always give us the right messages. So, I mean, these are just a few. I'm sure you know all of these people. Um, and, and I struggle with this because on that page, on that slide, there's not a single person who is actually qualified to give out nutritional advice. So from my point of view, when you are putting stuff out on Instagram or you're doing vlogs or, you know, or you're writing articles, you're writing books even, actually, you're kind of giving some misinformation. And, and the problem comes not to the majority of us. The majority of us can read something and go, yeah, I'll take a bit of that, but I'm going to forget about that. That's OK. The problem comes when you are somebody that maybe is a little bit susceptible to developing a poor relationship with food. Um, and again, I will, we'll go through what that would look like. So I guess some of the big trends that have come out over the last few years, um, eat clean, I think we all hear about that, is always hashtag eat clean, that's the big thing. It's almost like a badge of honour. I mean, the number of uh, athletes and, and clients that have come to see me, and they're like, I always eat clean, and they're really excited about the fact that they're actually saying that to me, and I'm like, okay. And they're then really a bit like, well, you don't seem impressed. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? What does eat clean actually mean? Because from my point of view, if I don't follow your rules, then somehow it makes me feel like I'm eating dirty, which I know I don't. So for me, labeling and terms and hashtags, while they're brilliant and useful, these things can be really quite, they can be quite detrimental to a lot of people. Um, so eating clean, green juices, superfoods, these are all things we hear about all the time. And I am not for one second saying that you shouldn't have a green juice and you shouldn't eat foods that are 
seem to be super, although I don't ever believe in a particular one food being super. It's more about your collection of foods that then gives you a, a balanced diet and all the nutrients you need. In the same way, I don't demonize any foods because I don't believe one food group alone or one food is what is going to cause you negative health problems. So some of the common misconceptions, sugar, let's talk about sugar. What do we know about sugar? What do we hear about sugar? Anyone want to tell well, me like what they... The main, like when you hear sugar, yeah. you're just encouraged to think that that's a bad yeah. category. It's yeah. always associated with like sweets, chocolate. Yeah. Um, but obviously and you've got... Yeah. 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 But then you've got the sugars that are good for you, like fruit sugars and stuff like that. So, but your main conception of it is as soon as you hear sugar, you go straight to the bad food. Yeah. Yeah, really, really, really good answer. And, and the thing is, for me, is that I think it's just been, it's been blown out of proportion as well. Because again, we have bloggers and influencers who talk about refined sugar-free and sugar-free cakes, but then you look at the re recipes and they're full of maple syrup and coconut sugar, and that is somehow is deemed healthier. But actually, at the end of the day, sugar is sugar, whether it is molasses, honey, white sugar, maple syrup. And one of my biggest kind of challenges to some of the bloggers, and I have been on stage with one, um, but I won't go there, and um, <laughs> is that actually, at the end of the day, you say that white sugar is processed. Well, it's no different to removing the sap from coconut to make coconut sugar. It's exactly the same process. There is no difference. So you cannot say that sugar, you know, white table sugar is processed and coconut sugar isn't because of the same thing. Biggest thing about all of it though is that they all give you the same amount of energy per 100 grams and they all are used in the body in exactly the same way. The body cannot, def you know, cannot kind of go, oh, this is coconut sugar, it's better for me, so I'm going to use it in this way. It doesn't. It just literally breaks it down, uses it in the same way. If you eat any product to excess, any product to excess of what your body needs, it will get stored as excess. The only thing I would say potentially in, t in kind of, kind of, in defense of some of these other sugars is that things like maple syrup, honey, they are sweeter. So potentially you could use less, potentially. But that's probably the only thing I would say. So otherwise, that for me, whether you're um, using table, white table sugar in, in your cake or whether you're using honey, it makes no difference. It's still a cake, enjoy it embrace it because actually there's nothing wrong with having cake or dessert every now and again and that's kind of what I want to get across. I don't have, I get really cross when I see people using, uh, having a, a brownie and they'll be, it's brilliant, it's really healthy for me because not only is it sugar free, it's also gluten free and it's like it's still a brownie, it still gives you the same amount of energy, it's still going to be used in the body in exactly the same way. Um, actually from my point of view, if I want a brownie, I'm just going to eat a brownie. Simple as that. Similarly, plant-based milks. Now, I get a lot of grief about plant-based milks because people seem to think that I'm like, you know, a real, uh, a real Nazi against them. The only reason I struggle with plant-based milks is because they are promoted in the wrong way. There is nothing wrong with using almond milk or oat milk or hemp milk or whatever you want to use if you prefer the taste. But don't kid yourself that you're going to get the same nutrients as you would from cow's milk. That's the only thing I would say. So I'm not anti any of them. You know, I, 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 you know, I would probably say that actually for some people the taste of almond milk is better than cow's milk. They prefer it. Great, but don't kid yourself that you're going to get the same nutrients. This is particularly, I find, with, with athletes, because obviously when it comes to working in, in, with, in the performance athletes that I work with, milk is such an important recovery drink because it's the right composition of carbs and protein. So if they then think they can recover in the same way with almond milk, they don't. And you can see from the kind of table that if you look at 200 mils of almond milk versus 200 mils of skim milk, almond milk's just pretty much expensive water. So what I say to people is, by all means use it, but don't kid yourself in thinking it's got the same nutrients. A lot of the milks, I, I say milks, I have to do this because it's not really milk, is it? But a lot of the, the, the plant-based milks are fortified with calcium now, which is a benefit. Um, I did a talk two days ago in Belfast and there was a, a professor who's very big on her bone health um, 
uh, research and one of the things that she came what she was talking about is that actually the intake of calcium is so important for our bone health um, and it doesn't matter how you get it but it's really important if you are below par even especially when you're sort of in your early late teens early 20s it can have a real negative impact on your health in your sort of 60s and 70s so it's a really important area gluten I've already mentioned gluten um, Again, I don't have an issue. If people want to be gluten-free, that's entirely up to them. Um, what I find interesting is that when I first qualified as a dietitian many, many years ago, nobody wanted to be gluten-free. Like, celiacs hated being gluten-free because actually it, there wasn't an awful lot of choice out there. And the foods out there that they were provided were really high in fat, really unpalatable, and really high in salt. And nobody wanted to do it. And now it just amazes me that we've got so many different options that people want to be gluten-free because they totally believe it's healthier. There is no evidence in any article you will read, a proper credible scientific article that is, that glut being gluten-free will benefit you if you don't need to be. <coughs> Obviously, if you have a medical reason, then of course you have to follow a gluten-free diet. And I think I, what, I, again, I find really interesting is that the athletes and the clients I work with who do have to be gluten-free, they really moan. They don't like it. They still don't think it's fair. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I think it's just been highlighted as a, a kind of a, a cure for immune problems and um, sort of digestive problems. Often, the reason why somebody who goes gluten-free feels better is because actually when you change any aspect of your diet, when you sort of decide you're going to follow a new thing, you become more mindful of what you eat. If you become more mindful of what you eat, you get a balanced diet. And actually that's what makes you better. That's what makes you feel better. It's not necessarily that you've gone gluten-free or sugar-free or, you know, or, or dairy-free. It's actually that you just become more mindful. And that's something that I hope, you know, is a, is a message I really want to get out there. So, what is the impact of this kind of hashtag eating clean or you know what where does it come into how does it become orthorexia so orthorexia as we said is kind of it's the obsession with eating correctly it's with eating pure and the problem is what might start off as a really innocent i'm just going to try and make myself feel a bit better i'm just going to eat just kind of try and cut out maybe you know cut out the takeaways or cut out um the biscuits and cakes every day or whatever it is, that's fine. We all do that. I have weeks where I go, oh my goodness, I've eaten so much chocolate, I really need to have two weeks where I don't eat very much. That's normal. That's not me being obsessive. When it becomes obsessive is actually when you cannot deviate. So when you start restricting and you, you basically cannot deviate and it starts to have an impact on things like your social life. So sadly, I see lots of people that come into clinic and they think they're fit and healthy, they think that you know, they're doing everything right, but when they can't join in with their friends. And I personally find that really, really sad because for me, food is more than just fuel. Food is about relationships, it's about networking, it's about bringing people together, and it's so important. It's kind of, you know, when I sit at a table, I can often spot someone who's got food anxiety because they're not joining in. They're so fixated on whether they can eat this or not eat it. They kind of miss out on that real kind of connectivity time with that, you know, with the people you want to be with. I know when I'm, like, I'm my, my job takes me all over the country and actually in different, to different countries as well. And I really miss out on that time with my friends. So usually the first thing I do when I get back into the UK or back home is kind of organize a meal out with some friends. I don't care what we're eating. I'm just there because I actually want to spend some time with my friends, but it's just nice to do it over food and wine. So for me, that's a really important thing. So the problem we have is once you've got somebody that's following these very strict food rules, they follow it because it makes them feel very safe and controlled. It, it gives them something to, to fixate on and focus on. But it can also then start to create things like vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So if you go dairy free and you don't replace it correctly, you will end up with maybe a deficiency in calcium um, and also potentially phosphorus. These are really important for bone um, and teeth and also muscle contraction. So that can be a problem. You might, if you decide to go gluten free, you actually might find you don't eat as much whole grain. 
actually whole grains are really important for the gut biome and we all are hearing loads more about how important the gut biome is and how that can help your mental health and how that can also help your digestive system. But again, people don't realise that these things are really important. So from my point of view, what people set out to kind of think they're going to be healthier actually makes them more unhealthy and this is what orthorexia is and the problem is they can't step away from it. They, they find it too difficult. So I guess the question is why? Why do some people, like if you, if we, you know, we're in, we're in a room here full of people, not everybody in this room is ever going to have any issues. Like often people, like we said earlier, will kind of, you'll read all these new things, you think, oh, I'll take a bit of that, but I'm not bothered about that. Like if somebody said to me that you can never eat chocolate again, I'd be, I'd be completely and utterly kind of distraught. So, you know, but that's just, that's just me. So why do some people look for food for the answer? Well, it's really about your personality type. And again, I'm not saying that everybody who's got this personality type is going to develop an eating disorder because if I, when I was writing the presentation, I was thinking, that's actually me. <laughs> um, and, and, <laughs> and I suddenly thought, I need to be really careful about that. But, but yeah, we know from studies that, generally speaking, it tends to affect people who are high achievers, they're very determined, they're very self-critical, um, they do have an obsessive streak in them. That's kind of the biggest element of it. Um, and they're very sensitive. So what happens is that they have that kind of, that, that perfect framework for where things can go wrong. And like I said, not everybody will. And I think it's really important that, that I highlight that. You know, you could have all those, like I said, you can have all those personality traits and actually be completely fine. A lot of it is to do about your experience. So as we go through life, we all experience different situations, different um, circumstances, and we interpret that in our own way. It's our perceptions. And it's those perceptions that can then start to create this very negative mindset. And that's where you then find that people are looking for something to help them make them feel better. And it's much easier to look at food, training, you know, some other element. It's much easier to focus on that and go, well, if I control that, I'm going to feel so much better. When actually what they don't appreciate is that a lot of the issues are going on with inside them. Because they're high achievers, because they're people that are always want to do the best, they never know when that's enough. They never know when, that, when they've hit that ceiling and actually they're very, very bad at accepting failure. And this is why actually I see this a lot in athletes because they are that very driven personality type. They hate failing, obviously, because obviously to be an Olympic or Paralympic athlete, you have to, to, to kind of, you don't, need, you don't want to fail. But actually the way I interpret it with my athletes is, do you know what? It doesn't matter. You learn from every experience. So if you didn't do that well this time, let's, 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 kinda, let's reflect on it and work out what went wrong, and then we try and fix it for next time. And these are things I'd love to be seeing in schools more, because this sort of mindset will develop in a school. This is, you know, when you're, you're in, you think about teenage boys, teenage girls, and, and the bullying and the kind of chastising and stuff that can happen, this is when these things can be set up. So while that might not be the time you develop your problem, if you are somebody that struggles with your sense of self and your sense of self-confidence, a lot of these things will be happening a lot younger. And it's only when you get to a certain point, there'll be one particular thing that will trigger it, but actually the, the, the process has started very early on. And that's why it's such a difficult condition as well to help, because sometimes the, the feelings and the emotions are so deeply ingrained, it's really hard to step away from it. And it's much easier to focus on trying to eat clean and be pure than actually deal with that real negative kind of emotion that's going on inside you, because that makes you feel uncomfortable. So we've already said uh, orthorexia and obsession with being pure, and Steve Bratman was the, was the, the, was the MD that kind of um, identified it. So what I wanted to do was give you a little bit of an idea of what goes on in the mind, like how it works, because none of this is intentional. That's the other thing, is that nobody goes out to develop a, an eating disorder, because it's really a very miserable place. Um, but a lot of it is about just not feeling like you're doing enough. You know, you, you kind of like, 
You know, I don't feel like I'm performing my best. Well, we could probably all say that at some point. We could, or we, we could probably all think, oh, we could have done better. But it's when you start acting on it. It's when you think, I need to do something to change it. You know, everybody else around me is so great. And it's when you do that constant comparison. And I always say to, again, people I work with, especially the younger teenagers that I tend to work with, there's a lot of comparisons. And that's another way social media can really come into play, is that, well, they're prettier than me. They're, they're more successful than I am. They're, you know, they, they've got, it looks like they've got it all. Um, I'll tell you a funny story in a minute, because actually I went through something like that very similar yesterday, but I'll tell you about it in a minute. <laughs> but, um, it was, um, but the problem is you can never compare yourself to anybody else, because we are all unique. We are all individuals. And there is nobody else. There's nobody else like me out there. Well, I don't think there is. Um, but there's nobody else like me. There's nobody else like yourselves out there. So comparing yourself to somebody else is just a futile way of making yourself feel worse. You can only actually compare yourself to yourself. So whenever I start to doubt things, which is quite often, I will think, well, compared to a week ago, I've now achieved this. Compared to a month ago, I'm on a par. And that's a much more kind of acceptable and more self-compassionate way, I guess, of, of looking at it. So the problem is, though, when you don't feel good enough, you're searching for something to make yourself feel better. And often it does, you know, in, in orthorexia, it's very much about, well, if I eat better, I'll feel better. We've all heard it, haven't we? And we see all the books, you know, eat this and you'll glow, or do this and you'll, you'll have loads of energy. We all see it. And of course, we buy into that because we're looking for an answer. The thing is, the answer's within us, because until you accept yourself and be com comfortable with who you are, it's really difficult to move forward from this. And this is why, when you, if you do notice these traits or these symptoms or these kind of these emotions in people you care about or even in yourselves, please try and get some help early on because actually the longer you stay in this cycle, the more entrenched these food rules become and the more impact they start to have and the harder it gets to step out of it, the harder it gets. Because the anxiety of stepping out of it is, is just too difficult to bear. So the way I tend to kind of describe it is that you're almost sitting on a box of emotions. It's like you're sitting on it so that you don't let any of those negative emotions come out. You don't want to deal with them. It's like absolutely when you so go through recovery you do have to jump off that box and you have to let the emotions out which does mean you tend to start to feel very uncomfortable now i suffer with anxiety massively the anxiety i felt as i came off the tube and walked to the google offices i cannot tell you i i'm i you know i do really struggle with anxiety but i've learned to manage it because i know that it will pass because it does pass but it's really hard if you're somebody who never allows yourself to feel it because you're constantly worried about what, what, what it's going to be awful, it's going to be catastrophic, because that's what the, the anxious mind does. It catastrophizes everything, and so you don't want to do that. But actually, the only way to move forward is to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Similarly, when you challenge negative behavior with behavior, that's when you change. But it's all very, it is difficult. It's a long, long process. So, obviously, when it comes to orthorexia, if when I'm working with people, is trying to help people understand that healthy eating is not just about what you put into your body. It's not just about what's on your plate at one time. It's actually about the collection, probably over two to three weeks. So, you know, you have a few bad days, it's all right. It's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean you've failed. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's just, you know, it's a bit busy. It's Christmas or it's birthdays or actually you've gone on holiday. That's okay. It's fine to relax because the norm is that you normally probably eat really well most of the other times and then it all balances out. So I try and actually really educate a healthy attitude to eating. Rather than healthy eating, it's actually a healthy attitude to eating. And I just think, again, when we're teaching in schools and, and kind of even in um, universities where this is a really big problem, that's what we should be teaching and educating people. It's not always about you know, the kind of the wheel and this is what healthy eating is. It's actually about that attitude because that's what is going to help people move forward. So my final slide really 
kind of is that the biggest thing is trying to be comfortable with who you are and it really is about self-acceptance and for some people that takes time and actually takes a lot of input. So majority of the people I work with, I work alongside a psychologist or a counsellor because the two things need to go hand in hand. Um, some people can do it themselves. Some people can, can make it, can turn it around. But majority, I'd say probably 90% of the cases I work with, it definitely needs both kind of um, nutritional and a psychological element. And sometimes more psychological than nutritional. Any questions? Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, I'm going to kick off if that's okay. Mm, of course. So you touched on it earlier about the the younger generation. Now, as sort of adults, I feel that we can make a bit of a better informed choice and kind of research in the media and things. But with children and kind of um, I don't know secondary school age, for example. How do you think the best way is to talk to them about their diet and to make sure that they can make those educated choices and then they're, they're not being influenced by the media? I think one of the biggest things is teaching them through, through food. So, you know, one of the problems we have is that when you're in, like, you look at secondary school menus and things and they're not very good or they're not the sorts of, comp they're not foods that maybe they're familiar with and that can be a real problem because, I mean, I've done workshops with um, young athletes and we've done f practical workshops where I've brought things like mackerel and avocado and things that and, and some of them are like well I've never seen that before well what is it like literally had no idea and you know you make them into things that are palatable and, and easy to use so I would never get somebody who's never had mackerel to eat mackerel because I think that's just quite harsh but actually what we did was we blended it up and we made it into a mackerel pate and interestingly for all the all the children that had never had it probably only two were like, no, I definitely don't like it. But the rest of them were really like, oh, and they went home and they were like, I want to have this again. So I think food needs to be quite a big part of education in schools because I think there's, there's a lot of, it's, it's kind of sometimes it's like something that you just have to do, you just have to give the kids. But actually if we feed our kids properly in schools, they'll also concentrate better. We'll get better productivity because again, we know that if they don't eat at lunchtime because they don't like what they see, then they'll either eat loads of sugar which is going to make them kind of peak and trough, or they'll just skip it. And the problem then is these are the things that then start to create this kind of negative relationship with food. Because if you do have somebody who's very vulnerable and they start skipping lunch because they don't like it, that becomes a behaviour and that becomes an acceptable behaviour to them. The problem you then have is that can then kind of go into their other aspects of their life and before you know it, you do have somebody who's, who kind of doesn't really know about food. So I think education is really important, but not just what you teach in the classroom. Actually getting in there and, and kind of getting the kids to work with food, taste food, try different things. But equally, I think, as I said, there needs to be a lot more on your sense of self, from, especially as a teenager. I mean... God, it's probably one of the worst times ever when you're a teenager, isn't it? Because everything's changing. You don't feel great. You don't look great. And we all know that you will get through it and you do, you know, you do eventually look fine. But at that point, <laughs> it's really, really hard. And you're so self-critical. And I think that's, that's something I would love to do more of in schools is really kind of look at how we promote a positive sense of self because I don't feel there's enough of that going on, if I'm honest. What is your opinion on every diet that is based on calories? Meaning, I've been there like a mm -hmm. year ago. I spent three months on having a certain amount of calories I could eat every day, meaning I was weighing everything that I was cooking, and I could only cook. I could not go out. I could not. It was uh, with like feedback um, mm -hmm. and like taking a step back on it. It, it sounds awful, um, but I've been there, and I'm wondering like what is as a dietitian your perspective on this there is like so many ways this can go wrong yeah actually so I actually very rarely talk about calories when I work with my clients because you're right it becomes obsessive again if you're working with somebody who is obsessive as soon as you give them a number or something to fixate on it, it it's what happens and and at the end of the day the body is really quite um, it's quite an amazing it's very good at regulating if you, if, you, if you 
let it, it will work for you really well. And that's again another big message I will say to people is that if you just listen to your body, it actually does tell you what you need when you need it. It's just that we've lost the art of doing that because there's so much, there's so much information. You know, like, like for example, the, the sugar stuff. Everybody's trying not to eat sugar because we've heard how bad it is for us. But actually there are times when the body and the brain can only work on sugar. And so if you deprive yourself, if you start to restrict yourself, the body will, will kind of work against you. So what I often find is when people severely restrict their calorie intake, less than what they need. Now, everybody in this room will have a very different requirement, but when they restrict their calorie at less of what they need, the problem you then have is that when food becomes available, the, the body will try and eat to excess because it will say, well, hang on a minute, I don't know when you're going to feed me again, so I'm going to take on as many calories as I can. That then then set up this real negative cycle of, oh my God, I've just eaten so much. I'm going to restrict again. And, and, and actually what you need to do in these situations is regulate your eating. So I tend to educate people on getting the correct balance of carbohydrates, proteins, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, at meal times and snacks. I'm not anti-snacks. I always have to eat every three hours, otherwise I fall apart. So, you know, I'm not anti any of those things. Um, but it's right for you as an individual, because if you are somebody that, say, does, an ex does exercise an hour a day, your requirements are going to be much higher than somebody that just sits at their desk all day long. And I think this is where we do get some problems because we as dietitians we talk very much about moderation and balance and of course that's really boring it's not sexy it's not exciting it's just a dull word and and it is um, but balance is about what's right for you now I have to be careful because I then get people saying yeah but I don't need to eat sugar then ever because that's what balance is for me but that's not what I mean balance is when I say that it's actually about giving your body what it needs but also allowing yourself to have the things you want. Because when you suddenly go, I do want that, but I can't have it, you set up a, a, a whole new mindset going on, almost like a deprivation cycle. So it can go one or the other way. You can either, you end up with people who will just want that food and that's all they can think about and they're gonna just eat loads of it. Or the opposite side to that is where um, it becomes, it causes anxiety. So I think in your case, from what I hear, is that it became quite an, ang you know, if you stepped even one calorie over what you were meant to have, it became, became a problem. Or it caused you anxiety, should we say, not made a problem. Now, this is why also I don't like, I don't like trackers. I don't like the online food trackers because one, it's really difficult to get the right thing of what you're eating and kind of make it work. The other thing is, how does that tracker know that actually today, it might be that actually depending on, on what's going on for you hormonally, depending on what's going on for you mentally, actually that day you do need a bit more. The tracker can't tell you that, but your body can. So when I re-educate people, it really is about helping them to see that eating is, should be fun and enjoyable. <laughs> And actually the balance is kind of very much, my principle is very much 80% of the time I try and eat as well as I can, which does mean that if I then want to have a glass of wine or a pudding or chocolate, then I can and I don't worry about it at all. And that I would use for anybody, whether they're doing really loads of exercise or whether they're not, because you can, it, it, it's proportional to what you do. Does that answer your question? It does. Uh, I have a question about what you talked about too earlier. You kind of made the reference to sugar and how your body doesn't actually know if it's coconut sugar or white sugar. Mm -hmm. But is there something in the science, and I'm asking you as a nutritionist, yeah. is there something in the science of how your body actually metabolizes that? Because you do see that some sugars are processed by your body differently, such as raising your glycemic index, for example. Yeah. Could you so, speak more to that? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, obviously some, some do have a slightly different glycemic index, but if you look at all the sugars that we've been exposed to, the difference is minute. Because at the end of the day, they are all simple sugars. So they all affect your, your, your blood sugars in the same way. So, um, so yeah, things like honey, for example, might have a slightly less glycemic load than table sugar. But we're not talking enough to make the difference that we're being, we're being told. That, I think that's the thing that is really important to, to understand is that 
the, the messages we're getting about being sugar-free and only eating honey and only eating maple syrup, etc., etc., actually, they're, they're not significant enough for it to be that, to make that change. I have one more question, sorry. Yeah. Um, going back into your 80-20 rule, which yeah. you just spoke about, is there danger in people creating morality around food then, being like, oh, this is part of that 20, or oh, this is part of that 80, I can eat freely for it. Like, do you see that that could also be like an obsession or something like a trigger in itself? Um, it's a really good question. I've never seen that because I don't ever really spell it out. It's kind of how I tend to, I don't sit there going, oh, well, I've eaten really well for 80% of the day today, so now I can have my piece of chocolate. I don't do it like that. I kind of look at it overall. So I tend to sort of know that actually I do that naturally. I don't have to think about it. It's kind of just what I do. Um, so when I work with people, I very rarely use percentages or numbers because I know that then that becomes obsessive and we kind of move away from that. It really is about, it's actually more about that attitude to food that I try and really work on, that kind of behavior change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think just to go back to your question about calories, like what I find really interesting about um, calorie restriction is that my flatmate does it and anyways, it's a whole thing, but um, she will have her certain amount of calories for the day and then, um, but she'll eat whatever she wants to make up those calories. So I might eat way, way, way more calories than she, or way, way more, but more calories, but it'll be, you know, through, you know, lean protein and whole grains and whatever, whereas somebody else might eat you know, way less calories, but it could all be crisps. Um, so I, what I find really interesting is like the idea that when you restrict yourself, you know, we talk a lot about the stuff that you're not getting, the nutrients you're not getting, but is it, does it also work the other way that you might be getting too much of something, like people who aren't eating you know, any sugar, dairy or grain, you know, they're obviously not getting those things, but are they getting too much protein and too much, um, you know, other nutrients that because they're trying to make up for what they're not eating yeah. do you know like almost yeah. too much of the good stuff is that kind of possible yeah, yeah. too absolutely i think i think the, the 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 whole thing about balance is that obviously if you if you increase your intake of any other food group you displace something else <laughs> so one of the things i really struggle with when i'm working with athletes is because they're trying to be healthy and they're eating loads of vegetables they don't get enough carbohydrate they don't get enough energy in to be able to perform because they're trying to be good and so, you, so that's what I mean, like, you know, it's kind of trying to get that balance for everybody as an individual. So yeah, you're quite right, because the thing is, that, again, everybody's body will always be trying to reach energy balance. So no matter where you're at, whether you're at the weight you want to be or whether you're not the weight you want to be, your body will always be working towards getting energy balance to basically maintain where you're at. So that's why often when you do decide to go on a very restrictive diet, you can probably do it for two or three days, unless you're very extreme and, and obsessive, and then you suddenly go, yeah, I can't do this anymore because I'm just exhausted and I'd, I'm hungry and I'm going to eat that burger or whatever it is. And you almost go the opposite extreme because the body's always working against that. It's trying to keep you alive. Remember that, that that's what the body's innate thing is. It's trying to keep you alive. So when people do restrict calories, it will slow down other processes. So the thing I see a lot um, is it's those silent things you don't see. So for example, when somebody's on a very restrictive diet and they restrict their calories, the body slows down the digestive system. So that can have a real, a real impact on um, how your body works in that respect. It will, in females, it will reduce estrogen. So menstruation will stop because the body's going, well, hang on a minute, I can't, there's no way I can fall pregnant and reproduce now because there's not enough energy in the system so it, it doesn't necessarily affect your weight and that's what's really interesting is because the body will actually slow everything else down to keep you alive so it will you'll find that you can't concentrate you get cold you know you can't you you, you, you can't really think straight it was all those different things you can't sleep that's an, a big one um, and that's something that people don't always realize that actually when you restrict your intake the body is doing everything it can to to kind of work against it. So quickly, one thing to pick up on though is really interesting is that you're right, some people don't change in weight and they, they stay the same and they might not eat the best way. They might literally make up their calories through McDonald's burgers or, or whatever, um, their choice, 
But that's not good either, and that's not what I'm promoting either. You know, it really is about if you eat the right things, if you base your meals around whole grains and complex carbs and lean proteins, you will feel full, you will feel better. Um, but that also means there is then room for those little indulgences if you want them. I think that's kind of the message you're trying to get across. Hi. Hi. Um, and we're talking about alternative milks. What about something like goat's milk? Mm -hmm. Is that as good as cow's milk yeah. or is that...? Yeah, I mean goat's milk is, is fairly similar in composition to cow's milk. So if I'm honest, when I work with somebody that can't, really realistically can't have milk, just, just has a, a lactose intolerance or a dairy intolerance or dairy allergy, then you have to find them something because you need to get the calcium in. Um, some people, goat's milk will work. It comes down to the protein or the, or the sugar in the milk, depending on, on what the problem is. So for some people, goat's milk's fine. Sheep's milk's good. For other people, even those, there's so much crossover with the proteins that if they are, if it's that particular protein that they can't digest, then you have to find another alternative. So in some cases it's soya, but we also know there's 40%, for people with severe dairy allergies, there's 40% crossover. So a lot of people that can't have dairy can't have soya. And that's where it becomes problematic because obviously then you're looking, then you do end up looking for something like almond or oat. Um, and like I said, I don't have a problem with people doing that, but what annoys me is the man marketing that it's on par because nutritionally it's not. So you just have to make sure that you get your nutrition from somewhere else, that's all. Hi, I have a lot of friends who swear by intermittent fasting, just eating two <laughs> meals a day and then starving for 15 hours. And that's something that I don't believe in and I like, don't feel in the right place to tell them that they're starving themselves. But do you have any specific um, advice for this area I, you know a lot of the ideas you yeah. say kind of um, contradict that this is good for you so yeah just I mean again intermittent fasting is one of those ones that's been really it's been around for a long time but it became its heyday probably a couple of years ago with the 5-2 and you know and, and that kind of thing I'm, I'm gonna say I do use intermittent fasting in some athletes but not in the 5-2 because I don't believe in two days a week where you eat only 500 calories because your body is just not in a happy place at all. But what I do sometimes do for athletes where I need to hit a particular body composition or, or weight, and it's just giving, it is giving them a rule, unfortunately, but it helps them. You do it for a very short period of time. But what we would do is, is actually the intermittent fasting where they eat for eight hours a day, so we say between 12 and eight, and then they'll have 15, you know, they'll have like the 16 hours have fasted because we know scientifically that's quite a useful way of helping athletes meet weight but with anything I do like that it's monitored it's supervised and it's only done for a very short period of time so with your friends doing the kind of if they're doing sort of two meals a day and and, and that's all they're doing for a start that's not intermittent fasting that's just fasting mm -hmm. Um, because intermittent fasting would mean they do it intermittently so they'd have some days where they eat well and other days where they eat very restrictive I think what's interesting is that when you look now at the data that's coming through, the people that were very big advocates of the 5-2 um, are struggling to maintain it. It's not sustainable because you then have two, maybe three days a week where you can't actually focus, you can't actually concentrate, you can't be productive um, and that because you, your body won't be on 500 calories a day. So it's hard when you've got friends and you're watching them and, and you want to say something um, and I think the only way you can sometimes do things is, 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 is give them some sort of tangible data, like, you know, did you notice that you made a mistake there, or did you notice that you haven't got, you're really tired, or you're actually really irritable, and it's not much fun to be around. It's, it's I mean, you have to be careful how you say that, obviously, <laughs> but, but it, it's that kind of, it's that kind of thing. I mean, with, I mean, they're often the opening conversations I have with a lot of my clients. I don't go straight in there and go, you've got a problem with food. It's very much about asking those open <coughs> questions, like, what's going on for you? Like, why are you following that? What, where, where's that come from? Because it's really important to hear why, because that's something that they feel really passionate about. And you don't want to sort of kind of belittle it. You want to encourage them to open and talk to you. So as a practitioner, building trust with my clients is the first step. And then after that, you can start to then kind of really 
tackle some of the, the kind of what's going on for you. Because you'll probably find that, again, there's a reason why your friends are doing that. If they are trying to maintain a certain weight or be a certain way or look a certain way, where does that stem from? What's that about? That's kind of how I'd go about it. Thank you. Any more questions from anybody? No? Thank you so much for coming okay. in. We really appreciate it. Um, Rini's going to be staying and signing copies of her book as well um, and also joining us up in the cafe. So if you'd like to purchase a book, please do let us know and she'll sign it for you. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>